We're excited that you've dialed into our digital sermon series here at NBC for 2021. Our mission here at NBC is to help grow resilient, biblically rooted families. And to that end, the teaching of God's word is our primary tool of ministry. We trust that these teachings, these sermons will be an encouragement to you and your family. We also want to encourage you to check out all the different activities we have throughout the year that focus on teaching of God's Word for you and your family. So make sure you check out our website at muskokabible.com. We trust again that this season, this summer, these sermon series will be an encouragement to you. God bless. All right. Boy, I've got a screen up here too. This is like, uh, this is like playing hockey, sort of. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the penalty box. Uh, well, we are able to meet again thanks to the ingenuity of uh, the folks here at Muskoka Bible Center, and uh, I'm glad that we have this beautiful indoor facility in which we can uh, study God's Word together. Thus far, uh, we have looked at the authority of God's Word on Sunday. Uh, Michael spoke to us about the inspiration of God's Word on Monday. I looked at the formation of the Old Testament canon uh, yesterday. And uh, today I want to speak to you about Jesus and the Bible. Uh, Dr. Haken is going to be tackling the New Testament canon in two sessions, one on Thursday and one on Friday, and that will sort of bring this aspect of the study of the doctrine of Scripture uh, to a conclusion. After I attended Bible school, which is getting to be a long time ago, I won't tell you how long, but I went to uh, university uh, for a year. There was a cooperative arrangement between what was OBC at the time and the University of Waterloo, which allowed you to transfer uh, credits and to earn another degree if you spent some time at the university. And uh, so I did that. And while at the university, I decided to take uh, three religious studies courses. Now, those religious studies courses uh, were quite a bit different from what I had taken at Bible school. And they challenged what I had learned about the Bible. Uh, the difference between hearing a uh, description of liberal, unbelieving uh, theology uh, from an evangelical professor. That is, the professor is describing the position and then uh, rebutting it. The difference between that and then going into a school and sitting under the teaching of somebody who actually believes this liberal interpretation of the Bible, um, that's that's a different experience. It's one thing to hear it second or third hand. It's another thing to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Uh, it was a good experience for me uh, because it made me go back and just examine again what it is I believed and why I believed it because you couldn't sit in those classes for very long without feeling constrained to give some kind of defense uh, for Orthodox uh, Christianity. One of the things that really helped me through that time when it came to the doctrine of Scripture was answering the question, what did Jesus believe about the Bible? I mean, there are all sorts of ways to look at uh, the doctrine of Scripture and to, uh, you know, substantiate biblical authority, but one simple way to do it, it's not the only way, but one simple or basic or fundamental way to do it, a, a thing that I've come back to over and over again, it's okay, uh, first of all, what does the Bible teach about itself? And we've considered that question. But then secondly, what, what did Jesus believe about the Bible? What did Jesus believe about the Old Testament? And then uh, what did he believe about the New Testament? In some ways, it's a little more straightforward to answer the first question. What did he believe about the Old Testament? The New Testament is a little uh, more complex because... Uh, the New Testament didn't exist when Jesus was here on earth and when he was doing his uh, teaching and ministry. And yet, I hope to show you this morning that we can very confidently uh, know not only what Jesus taught about the Old Testament, but what he believed about the New Testament. And then I want to add a third uh, dimension, 
And that is, I want to conclude by talking about Jesus as the yes and the amen of God, because that's one of the ways that he is described uh, by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. He is the yes and he is the amen of God. And when we ponder that verse in light of his view of Scripture, uh, it tells us something very important, not only about the authority and inspiration of Scripture and so forth, but how to go about uh, interpreting it. Because as we consider Jesus' view of the Scripture, we're going to run into a bit of a puzzle. And I'll, I'll give it to you right up front. I want you to think about it. I'll try to resolve it as we go through. We're going to see that Jesus is going to affirm in no uncertain terms the full authority of the Old Testament. And yet at the same time, he, in his teaching here on earth, is going to develop the teaching of the Old Testament. He's going to indicate that certain parts of it have undergone change. And uh, this doesn't represent him turning his back on the authority of the Old Testament, but rather represents uh, his ultimate role as the Son of God who brings fulfillment. And uh, fulfillment, as I hope to uh, illustrate for you is something that doesn't just mean he rubber stamps what has been said before as though it exists forever and forever, but he fulfills it. And fulfillment by its very nature not only involves escalation and involves more glory, but it involves change. There is transformation that takes place as you go from the old to the new, as you read the law and the prophets in light of the person, the work, the teaching of Jesus and, of course, his apostles. Well, let's uh, start with Jesus and the Old Testament. What, what, did he, what did he believe about the Old Testament? Well, here we're, 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 we're operating like investigators. Uh, we're sleuths. And we're we're uh, looking at the evidence and uh, drawing conclusions from the evidence. Well, what do, what do we see as we... As we uh, read about the teaching of Jesus while he was here on earth. Well, we find him making a number of sweeping statements. And I, I want you to appreciate how sweeping these are, how universal they are. He makes sweeping statements about the truthfulness, the absolute truthfulness of the, of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. One uh, passage that we've referred to a number of times already, but I'll read it for you again. Matthew 5, verses 17 to 19. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but fulfill them. Why would anybody think that Jesus had come to abolish the law and the prophets? Well, if you know the context of that verse, those verses, you'll know that this is the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus has already given what we know as the Beatitudes, these eight sayings that tell us who is approved of by God. Sometimes people interpret the word blessed to mean happy. That's a kind of superficial interpretation, because you can be blessed and not necessarily be feeling all that happy. All you have to do is think about the beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Well, it doesn't just mean blessed, you know, happy are those who mourn, but it means, it means approved of by God. Same thing with blessed are the persecuted. These people are approved of by God. Well, as Jesus lays out those beatitudes... Uh, in a very authoritative manner, and people are listening to him, they're thinking to themselves, who in the world is this fellow? I mean, that's indicated at the end of the sermon. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the religious leaders. Who is this fellow? And Jesus, of course, understanding his audience, knows exactly what they're thinking, and so he kind of cuts them off at the pass. Do not think, in other words, I know what you're thinking. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. That's not true. That's not what I've come to do. I have not come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. And here's this sweeping statement. For I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear. Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. 
But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Anyone comes along and tells you that you can jettison the Old Testament as a Christian, you need to remind them of this verse, or you need to read these verses over again for yourself. That is not true. And anybody who teaches that uh, will find that uh, their teaching is not approved of by God. We have another sweeping statement. This is the only other one I'll read into the record, but it, uh, it's an important one. There, there are more, but this is an important one. Luke's gospel, again, I've mentioned this already this week, Luke 24, 25 to 27, on the Emmaus Road, how foolish are you? Uh, here were two people, Cl- uh, Clopas and his companion, and they were downhearted. Their hopes have been pinned on Jesus, but he has been executed, and, and, and the lights have gone out in their world. They don't know what to do next, and they've just poured out their hearts to the Lord, and here's his response. How foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. That's a sweeping statement. Beginning with Moses, that is beginning with creation. Starting back in Genesis 1 and 2. That's where Jesus begins the story, because that's where God begins the story. And that's why we have to be very careful monkeying around with the interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2. I know there's all kinds of different views out there in the Christian community, but we need to be very, very careful. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what is said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So we have these sweeping statements. Secondly, looking at Jesus' view of the Old Testament, we find as we read that Jesus affirms persons, places, and events recorded in the Old Testament. And I want to add something very important. He confirms them as as historical realities, not as mythology. So he doesn't read the Old Testament in a mythological way, as, as is often done today. So... And I won't give you all the verse references. You could easily find these with a concordance. Uh, But in the interest of time, I'll just mention the names. He talks about Abel. He talks about Noah. He talks about Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. He talks about Isaac and Jacob. People are going to sit down in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He talks about Solomon. Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as one of these. He talks about Elijah. He talks about Elisha. He talks about Jonah. As Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days in the earth. He talks about Zechariah. He confirms the reality of Sodom and Gomorrah. But he does say of Sodom and Gomorrah, it will be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than it would be for Chorazin and Bethsaida and so forth, places, towns in which he had walked and taught the people because their light, their responsibility, therefore, was so much greater than old Sodom and Gomorrah. But he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. He talks about the institution of circumcision. He talks about Moses as the lawgiver. He talks about uh, the time when the serpent was lifted up on the pole. And the plague was stopped in the camp of Israel. He talks about manna in the wilderness, how God fed the people with that uh, supernaturally provided uh, food. He talks about David eating the consecrated bread when he is on the run from Saul. He he confirms that David is the author of, of at least some of the Psalms. He quotes the Psalms and ties them to, uh, to David. Uh, he talks about the suffering of the prophets, about the popularity of false teachers, 
He affirms the creation account and the establishment of marriage at the beginning of humanity. Quoting Genesis 2, verse 24, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's not mythology to Jesus. Adam is not some uh, typological character. He's a historic person, as is his wife Eve. And uh, the creation account and marriage that is tied to that is confirmed by Jesus. Uh, Jesus affirms the moral and theological teaching of the Old Testament. The greatest commandment, he says, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He's putting together two passages, one in Deuteronomy, one in Leviticus. He combines them together, and he puts his stamp of approval on them. This this is what it is. When he's asked, what's the greatest commandment, He, he, he gives this answer from the Old Testament. And then he adds uh, uh, an addition to it. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, The golden rule that he gives us in the Sermon on the Mount, do to others as you would have them do to you, which is different than similar types of rules in the ancient world. There are other versions of that, that kind of idea in the ancient world, but they were always in the negative. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. But Jesus flips it around. He puts it in the positive. And by so doing, it's far more uh, expansive and and far-reaching. Do to others. It's not just refrain from doing to people what you don't want them to do to you, but do to them. What, What do you want done to you? Well, you turn around and do that to others positively. Man, that's a, that, that's a, a mouthful, to say the least. But Jesus... Uh, gives it to us as the summary of the Law and the Prophets. You want to know what the Law and the Prophets are all about? Well, in one way you can look at love to God, love to neighbor, and another way you can look at it in terms of this, do to others what you would want them to do to you. There's no evidence of accommodation. You know, sometimes uh, people say, well, yes, uh, Jesus affirms the Old Testament. It doesn't necessarily mean he believes it as literally true. He's just accommodating himself to the ignorance of the people or to the beliefs of that time. That is an incredibly arrogant kind of position for people like us in the 21st century to take. Of course, we we are arrogant, right? We think that we're the wisest human beings who ever walked upon the face of the earth because we got a few electronic gadgets. But we're not. Um, we, We are... Human beings, just like human beings who have gone before us, we're capable of doing great and very interesting things, but the, 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 the heart matters, the deepest needs of our lives remain unchanged. And that's why the Word of God continues to speak to us, whether we are human beings living before the coming of Christ, at the coming of Christ, or now as we are uh, several thousand years later. No evidence of accommodation. He says in John chapter 10, verse 35, as a kind of parenthetical comment, and the scriptures cannot be broken. That's a kind of given, a very powerful, uh, you know, if you're ever t- tempted to doubt the authority of the Bible, just remember this one saying of Jesus. Jesus said, as, as, as a kind of side comment, in, in dealing with something else, and the scriptures cannot be broken, Period. He says in that fascinating account in Luke 16 about the rich man and Lazarus that if people will not hear Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced if someone rises from the dead. That's an important verse to remember. We've had no end of people that come along from time to time saying, you know, the problem with the church is there's no power. And by power, they mean we need, you know, outward signs and wonders in order to get people's attention. Well, I agree that we have a power problem today. But it's not a power problem that will be solved by just supernatural signs and wonders. It's a power problem that can only be solved as the Spirit of God is poured out and He takes the Word of God and drives it home 
with resurrection power to the human heart. We need God to perform the greatest miracle of all miracles, and that's the resurrection of the sinner who is dead in their trespasses and their sins. Of course, the rich man says, I've got brothers. Um, Please say something to them so they don't come to this terrible place. Jesus says they have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. If they will not listen to that word, they will not be convinced if someone rises from the dead. And of course, that's true, is it not? Because Jesus has risen from the dead. And people today still doubt that fact. One of the amazing things about the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11, it always always strikes me as, as interesting is that, you know, Jesus performs that miracle. Lazarus, come forth, and out he comes. He's been dead four days, and he comes out of that grave. And no sooner does a miracle happen, the next thing we're told, that some of the people who were there ran off to the scribes and the Pharisees, and they told on Jesus, told all that was going on. And then they hold a meeting and say, we've got to do something about this guy. And they, and they plot his death. Well, here's a miracle. Here is a guy who was called back from the dead, Lazarus right in front of everybody's eyes. Some people give glory to God by God's grace, but others, it doesn't phase them. What's going on in their minds, how they can kind of uh, sublimate what has taken place, I do not know. But Jesus, in this uh, statement, in this account that he has given, again, I think, underlines the power of Scripture and the authority of Scripture and uh, the fact that if we have the Word of God, uh, we uh, really do not need anything else. Uh, Jesus affirms the authority of the Old Testament versus the religious leaders of his day. Now, I I talked about this yesterday. I, I didn't give you the verses I'm going to give you today. These are very helpful just to Uh, to fill that out a little bit. So remember I said yesterday that when he's debating with the the Jewish leaders, he never questions. And when the apostles debate with the Jewish leaders, they never question the extent of the canon. That is, they they, they don't say, well, you guys are working with the wrong scriptures. Your, 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 Your Bible has things in it that are not really the word of God. And so therefore, your understanding of God is in error. They never say that. They assume the authority. They confirm the authority of the Hebrew Scriptures. What they say is your interpretation of those Scriptures is is, uh, is not correct. Or what they say is you have the Scriptures, but you don't obey them. You don't follow the Scriptures as you should, of course, ultimately to Jesus. So, for instance, in Matthew 23, we find Jesus saying, verses 1 to 3, uh, he's talking to his disciples and he says, Do what the Pharisees teach but not what they do. He says their teaching is okay, as long as, of course, they're sticking to the text. Nothing wrong with that. But the problem is with their practice. They're great teachers. They just aren't good followers. They're not obedient to the word of God. So do what they teach, not what they do. Uh, in Matthew 15, verses 1 to 9, he contrasts human rules with God's rules. This is that passage, you know, where the Pharisees were, were playing around with the, with the law of God, looking for loopholes. They're supposed to care for their parents, honor your father and mother. That's a very important commandment. Uh, they, uh, they didn't want to spend too much money on, on their parents and caring for their parents. So they had this loophole that if they were to declare that money Corban, if they were to devote it to God, and apparently that doesn't even mean they had to sort of transfer the money to the temple or anything like that. It just means they had to declare this sum of money belongs to God. Then they didn't have to use that to look after their parents. Whether or not it ever got to God, per se, was another question. And Jesus knows all about that. He said, you people are manipulators. Uh, you've got all of your human rules that you use to, uh, to set aside God's rules. Uh, a stunning verse is Matthew chapter 22, verse 
uh, 29, and there's a parallel in Luke, uh, or I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 12, verse 24, where uh, the, the Sadducees think they've cornered Jesus. They've got this story that they have obviously deployed before. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, and so they have this, uh, this woman who's married to seven brothers. It's a, if, no doubt a fictitious account. No, either that or those brothers uh, should have caught on at some point <laughs> because uh, after they, uh, she married them, they all died uh, in succession. And then eventually the poor woman dies. And of course, the, the question from the Sadducees is, all right, you believe in the resurrection? So answer this, uh, in, the, you know, in the resurrection, whose wife shall we, uh, uh, will she be? Because she belonged to all the brothers. And what does Jesus say? He says, oh, you got me. <laughs> Never thought of that. That's very good. No, he doesn't. He says, listen, you people err, you're in error, why? Because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. You see, your, your, your whole illustration is a, is a complete waste of time. Because if you knew the scriptures, you would know that God is not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob live in the presence of God, even as Jesus speaks to these Sadducees. And if you knew the power of God, you would not question the reality of the resurrection. But you err, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. And then there's Matthew 22, verses 41 to 46. This is the Pharisees. They, 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 they come with their question. Uh, and, um, I'm sorry, this is after the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees have come with their questions. And this is Jesus actually responding to the Pharisees with his own question. This is Jesus saying to the Pharisees, the Messiah, whose son is he? And then he quotes, what, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. How can the Messiah, who the Pharisees acknowledge is David's son, how can the Messiah, David's son, also be David's Lord? And from that point on, they don't ask him any more questions. Now, we can answer the question. We should be able to answer the question. We understand that the Messiah is both David's son and David's Lord, because though he descends from David. According to his flesh, he is the Son of God, and thus David's Lord. The Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, that is Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Well, in all of this, Jesus is affirming the authority of the Old Testament, using the scriptures uh, to, uh, to rebuke these religious leaders. Jesus understands his life and ministry in terms of the Old Testament. I mentioned yesterday about his baptism, that uh, what Steve Dempster calls his identity card. You know, he's the beloved son with whom God is well pleased, joining together Genesis and Psalms and Isaiah. But you know, as you follow uh, the ministry of Jesus, that when he's tempted by Satan in the wilderness, what does he do? It is written it is written, it is written, he says. Uh, his ministry fulfills Isaiah 61. Dr. Haken mentioned this on, on Monday. He stands in the synagogue and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah is given him to read and, and he reads Isaiah 61. Imagine being in that synagogue that day when that young man stood up and began to read. And then he says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And whatever amazement they might have felt temporarily as they heard him read dissipated because they then tried to lay hands on him and put him to death. But it's not his time. When he is preparing his disciples for his rejection in Jerusalem and his, his, uh, his trial and his death and his burial and his resurrection... He says in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 and 32, that he must be rejected, he must die, he must rise again, as the prophets predicted. 
This is all in the fulfillment of the Old Testament. When he is betrayed by Judas in John chapter 13, verse 18, he quotes Psalm 41, verse 9 as being fulfilled. In John 15, verse 25, he quotes Psalm 35, verse 19. They hated me without a cause. They hated me, he says. They're going to hate you. You better be prepared for that. This is what the scripture says. They hated me without a cause. When he cries out, the cry of dereliction, as it's sometimes called, the cry of abandonment from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22. Scripture is part and parcel of who he is. Of course, that's not a surprise because who is he? He's the word of God become flesh. And the word, his own word, just comes forth from him over and over and over again. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Quoting Psalm 31, verse 5. And then, of course, uh, we've already mentioned that post-resurrection summary of his, of his life that he gave on the Emmaus Road in Luke 24, verses 25 to 27. And there's other evidence I'll just quickly mention because I want to move on to the, to the New Testament. Uh, he understands, it's clear when you read carefully through the Gospels, that he understands the interplay between human authors and divine inspiration. Moses, Isaiah, David, Daniel, and others speak in the Old Testament, but according to Jesus, they speak with divine power and authority. Not only the writers, but their writings are inspired. And by that, of course, I mean uh, they, they come from God. Not only the writers, but the writings here are Two verses that speak of that, both in the Gospel of, of John, John chapter 5 and verse 39, and then John chapter 7 and verse 38. John chapter 5, uh, verse 39, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. This is the tragedy of, of the Old Testament. This is the tragedy of the scribes and the Pharisees. This is the tragedy of, of uh, any of the Jewish people who uh, refused to acknowledge that Jesus was the Messiah. So diligent to study the scriptures, especially these leaders. This was their life's work. They were experts in the scripture. But the, but the horrible irony was that they missed the whole point of the Scriptures. And when the fulfillment of the Scriptures came among them, they didn't recognize Him. And worse than that, they saw Him as a blasphemer and demon-possessed and someone that should be executed. How poignant the words. You, you study the Scriptures, he says, because you think that in them you have eternal life. But they testify about me, and you won't come to me. John chapter 7. John is full of this kind of thing. I taught this in the past semester at school, John, the Gospel of John. And why is a very, very, just remind me what a rich, rich gospel uh, it is. John chapter 7, verse 38, but it's really 38 through 39. It's a powerful section. This is a, this is a verse that, that I think confirms the idea that although the Holy Spirit of God was at work in the Old Testament and no one has ever become a believer without the Spirit's work, there is a new covenant fullness of the, of the Spirit's work that is tied to the redemptive activity of Jesus. Very important. There's a new covenant blessing of the Spirit of God that, uh, that we enjoy in, at this point in redemptive history that was not known to the same extent in, in uh, times past. And, and here, uh, I think we have Jesus articulating this. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, there's that 
quotation of Scripture. Rivers of living water will flow from within them. And then here we have the explanation, and we're so thankful for it. By this, he meant the Spirit. Those are the rivers of living water that are going to flow. Whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up till that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, when it says the Spirit had not yet been given, it's not saying that the Spirit was not active in the Old Testament. We, we can easily demonstrate that's not the case. Second verse of the Bible, the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the deep. No, the Spirit's everywhere in the Old Testament. But there is a blessing of the Spirit, a fullness of the Spirit that is attached to Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into the heavenly throne room of God. That's manifest on the day of Pentecost. And the power of the Spirit that we need to know today uh, desperately in our lives. Well, he's not just saying that whoever wrote that Scripture is inspired. He's saying that Scripture is inspired. And then just the last one I'll mention along this line is there are a few places where if you're reading carefully, and again, none of us read that carefully. That's our problem. We, we get familiar with Scripture. We just read along. But reading carefully, it should strike us because there's a number of places where Scripture speaking can be substituted for God speaking. So, for instance, in Romans chapter 9, verse 17, Scripture speaks to Pharaoh, it says. Well, that's not who spoke to Pharaoh. Moses spoke to Pharaoh. Moses delivered the message of the Lord to Pharaoh. But in, when Paul tells us about that or quotes that event, he talks about it in terms of Scripture speaking to Pharaoh. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, Scripture announces the gospel. Now, well, I thought, I thought that the apostles preached the gospel. I thought that we as Christians are supposed to preach the gospel. Yes, we do, but the Scripture also preaches, announces, proclaims. I'm going to look at this on Sunday morning, Lord willing. The Scripture is a powerful word, which is to say it is a living word. We're not just talking about the incarnate word, the Lord Jesus Christ, but Scripture itself has powers. This is a powerful book. It's a supernatural book. People read it and their lives are changed. There's all kinds of testimonies to that. Maybe that's been your experience. Many a testimony about people going and, you know, all sorts of directions and coming to the, the, almost the end of their lives, even contemplating suicide. You think you hear these stories from the people like the Gideons and folks like that. Someone's all alone somewhere in a hotel room and where hotels still have those, they open up the, the bedside table drawer and they pull out that Gideon Bible and they start to read just because they've got nothing else to do. But I mean, over and over again, you'll hear stories of the power of the Word of God, where the Word of God seizes them. Oops, sorry. And that's not, that's not a preacher season, and that's just the power of Scripture. And they begin to reading, and they can't stop reading because that's a, it's, a, it's a living Word. That's what's being spoken about. That's what's being about, spoken about here. The Scripture speaks. That's why you give people the Word. On LinkedIn, I like to put up a verse every day. That's all I do most of the time. Just a verse. Maybe two. You, know, something, you say, well, why, why bother you? Why don't you talk about anything else? Why don't you get involved in all the controversies that are out there? Well, I don't have time for all that nonsense. I think the best thing I can do, if I, if, if I can do anything, is just put a verse up. <laughs> why do I think that? Because I know that the Scripture speaks. And it's got power. And that people, even if they're not intending to read the Scripture, are exposed to that Scripture. It has the ability just to, to get a hold of them, to get into their mind and into their heart. Well, Jesus in the New Testament. During the time uh, Jesus was ministering on earth, the New Testament had not yet been written. So, so how in the world can we speak about Jesus in the New Testament? Well, we can do it in this way. Um, Jesus, while he was here on earth, spoke about two important developments connected to the New Testament or New Covenant Scriptures. And what are those two developments? The apostles and the uh, ministry of the Spirit, this ministry of the Spirit that I've just been speaking about. 
Who are the apostles? Well, the apostles, uh, the word apostle means messenger, as you, I'm sure you know. But there's a technical use, and the technical use uh, refers to those men who were specifically chosen by Jesus to walk with him during his days here on earth and to be eyewitnesses of his death, burial, and resurrection. These men were called uh, to not only do that, but to play a foundational role in the establishment of the New Testament church, New Covenant church, and in the production of scriptures, which would explain and expound the, the, uh, the ministry of Jesus. The Apostle Paul is uh, something of an exceptional case. I think the scripture indicates that. He, he himself describes himself as one abnormally born. Uh, how so? Well, he wasn't uh, there with Jesus all the way through the mini- his ministry like the other apostles were. But he did encounter the risen Lord on the, on the road to Damascus. And he was specifically commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ as the great apostle to the Gentiles. And not only that, but you know that the apostle Paul went to seminary in the wilderness, and the instructor there was Jesus himself. He tells us that in the first part of Galatians. Right? He went into the desert of Arabia, and for three years, he was taught by the Lord himself. And that's why when he emerges out of that experience and begins his apostolic ministry, he is able to go into the synagogues and to refute Uh, those who uh, do not understand who Jesus is and prove from the scriptures that he is the Messiah. He's also, of course, able to go into the Areopagus and speak to the Athenians and and, uh, proclaim the gospel to them. So we have the apostles, and then we have this work of the Spirit. The Spirit is going to be poured out. The Spirit is the gift of that is going to be poured out from God the Father, from God the Son, when Jesus ascends as the great Melchizedekian priest into the presence of God, right? That's what Hebrews is all about. He comes into the presence of God, having made purification for sins. He comes in as our great high priest, whoever lives to make intercession for us. And there in the presence of God, the Father and the Son pour out the Spirit. Now, the Spirit is poured out on all Christians, and that's very important. But the Spirit is poured out in a special way on these apostles. These men are specifically equipped to understand what Jesus has said. They've, they've been hanging out with him for three years, but up until the very end, they still didn't know what was really taking place. I mean, Peter and John, they arrive at the open tomb on, on, on the first day of the week, and, and uh, they still don't really understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Uh, John tells us that he, he, he went in, and he, he saw what was going on, and he believed. Ah, finally, I get it. Imagine how thrilling it would have been in those days following that event as the, that group of people uh, gathered together, Mary and uh, the, the other women and the disciples and, and uh, people with them, and they now were, uh, the, uh, their eyes were open. They understood the scriptures. Oh, man, how could we have been so blind? That's exactly what he told us. This verse, that verse, all of a sudden, it just, everything starts to, starts to happen. And this is what Jesus said would take place with regards to these men. Uh, he says in John 16, verse 12, I have much to, uh, more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will, take, uh, he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that you will... Uh, He will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. And this, of course, is exactly what happened, right? The the disciples understood, and, and, um, and they begin to preach. I mean, think about it. Think about the... The miracle of the day of Pentecost. Now, I'm not just talking about the descent of the Spirit, uh, you know, in the tongues of fire that are seen on that occasion, and the gospel that's being proclaimed, uh, you know, to the people that were there in, in all of their different languages. I'm not just talking about that. One of the greatest miracles, I think, of the day of Pentecost is the fact that Peter stands up 
The same Peter who not long before had three times denied the Lord. Peter who was, you know, made progress in some areas and not in other areas. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Jesus says, and then a little later in the same passage, oh Lord, you're never going to have to die. Get behind me, Satan. That Peter, up and down and all over the place, standing up on the day of Pentecost and saying, these men aren't drunk as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. I'll tell you what's going on. And then opening up the scriptures in such a masterful way. I mean, what a sermon. He talks about Jesus. He is both Lord and Christ. And of course, the Spirit of God is there in that word, blessing that word. And brothers, what must we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. You'll receive the gift of the Spirit. 3,000 are baptized. The church is born as a new covenant entity. Born in a moment. Born in a day. So you want to know what Jesus thinks about the New Testament? Well then, remember the fact that he commissioned and trained the apostles. He, as the risen Lord, along with the Father, poured out the Spirit upon them. And as a result, they not only proclaimed the truth about Jesus, but some of them were involved in writing down Some of them and their associates, people that they were um, associated with, were involved in writing down what God wanted preserved until Jesus comes again. Now, this brings me to to the last thing that I want to get to in conclusion, and that is Jesus as the yes and amen of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. What am I getting at? Well, I want to return to something that I said way back at the beginning. Remember, um, I quoted to you, from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 19. Don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, talking about some of the little marks that are part of the Hebrew text, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will by any means disappear from the law. And law there, when it's used the second time, is a way of... Law can refer to the, to the Torah, to the Pentateuch, first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures, but it can also refer to the, to the whole thing. You can talk about it as the law and the prophets, or you can talk about the whole uh, Old Testament revelation, the whole as law. And I think that's what he's doing the second time. We'll disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, what about the last half of Matthew chapter 5, beginning in um, verse 21, where Jesus starts to say, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. Now, some of those, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, involve Jesus correcting misinterpretations of God's law and and bringing back into into focus the the truth of, of the law of God given in the Hebrew Scriptures. But there are other things that are said in that series of verses that go to the end of the chapter that take us beyond uh, what is said in the law. How in the world can Jesus do that? Or to give you perhaps uh, some examples that might be easier to grasp, take the food laws. You get all these food laws, all these laws about clean and unclean that are found in the law. Jesus says, uh, 
you know, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or least stroke of the pen. Well, well, what about the food laws? Because in the New Testament, uh, we find him declaring all foods clean. That's how the apostles interpret his comments. It's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean. It's what comes out of a man. And uh, Mark, listening to that, uh, recording that event, says, by this he declares all foods clean. Well, well, how can it be that nothing passes from the law, but all foods are clean? Or the sacrificial system. Right? You've got that elaborate sacrificial system. You've got the tabernacle. You've got the temple. You've got the Levitical priesthood. But we know that all of that is no longer operative. It's become obsolete, the book of Hebrews says. How do we put those things together? Or the Sabbath. This is another one, a little more contentious. Got to be careful what I say here. Or the Sabbath. I don't believe that when Jesus was here on earth, he, he ever violated the Sabbath as it was given by God in the Old Testament for the simple reason that Galatians 4 tells us that he was born under the law. He, he came into the world as, as a Jew under the law in order to redeem those who are under the law. So I don't think that he... At any point, he actually violates the Sabbath law, but what he certainly does is he challenges the understanding of the, of the religious teachers of his day with regards to the Sabbath. They had gone way beyond God's law. They had made it a burden to the people, but G- and Jesus challenges that. But more than that, I think he prepares the way for exploding their understanding of that concept. Again, I'm going to say more about this on Sunday morning, I think, when we talk about Hebrews 3 and 4, and the Word of God alive and active, but that's another thing. But, but I think he's preparing the way because ultimately, the Sabbath rest of God that's spoken about back in Genesis is broken by human sin. And the rest that God gives the children of Israel in the promised land is but a temporary rest. And in Psalm 95, God speaks about another day of rest to come. And Jesus, when he comes into the world, says, If you're weary and heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. And the Apostle Paul can say in Romans 14, Don't let anyone judge you with regards to days and Sabbaths. And so these are a shadow. Colossians says the thing, these are a shadow of the things that are to come. So what's Jesus doing? Is he, is, he, is he breaking his own rule here? What about um, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and God what belongs to God? Man, this is contentious today. The, the, the people he's speaking to didn't, were not comfortable with that concept because they, they were used to a theocracy, direct rule from God. But that's, that's over now. This is, a, this is a new covenant era. God directly rules over his church. He doesn't directly rule over any country. Not in the sense that he did of Israel in the Old Testament. When Jesus is, is, is laying the foundation for that understanding that's articulated by the apostles later. But, but is he not? But the point is, is he not breaking? Or here's the here's uh, last one, an illustration of this is, okay, in the Old Testament... Almost all of your patriarchs were polygamous. In other words, not one of the patriarchs is qualified to be an elder in a New Testament church. Stop and think about the list of people that I'm referring to. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. Not one of them. Why? Because an elder is supposed to be the husband of one wife, and they're not. Were they all adulterers? Some people would say that, well, they all committed adultery when they got married to these other women. Well, that's the case, we got problems because the Bible says no adulterer will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Can't live in unrepentant adultery and be... Saved. Are we going to dismiss all the patriarchs? No, don't think so. 
You see, this, this leads us into the, a whole discussion. We don't have time to introduce him. Probably I shouldn't, but I'm just, this leads us into a whole discussion about what it means to fulfill. I didn't come to abolish. I didn't come to destroy. But I came to fulfill it. And that doesn't necessarily mean I came just to reinforce the status quo. I came to fulfill it, which tells us that the whole Old Testament is in one sense prophetic, not just talking about the future, but it's talking about ultimate realities. And and it's pointing forward to what God is going to do in his great son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it does it in all kinds of different ways. And so what he's doing when he says, I didn't come to abolish it, I came to fulfill it, is he's saying, you're never going to understand what's going on back there unless you come to me. And when you come to me, and when you learn to read the scriptures in light of what I have done on the cross, and where I am right now at God's right hand, and in light of the authoritative new covenant revelation that I've given you, as you start to put all that stuff together, and that's really the job of us as Christians, especially Christian preachers and teachers, we're supposed to lead people in all that, We've got to, we, and, and you can't do it by ignoring the Old Testament. You've got to have that Old Testament in order to do it. Because when you have the Old Testament and you open it up in light of Jesus, it's absolutely stupendous. Then you don't have to stoop to all kinds of other tricks and gimmicks in order to get people in. Just give them the word of God. It's life-changing and there's no message like it anywhere. Now, in case you're worried about those patriarchs, and their status as polygamous. Let me just tie up that loose end. I don't want anyone to be in deep distress. Personally, I think the best way to understand that is the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, meant one thing, to put it very bluntly, under the old covenant, and is returned by Jesus to the original standard of God, when he comes in the, in the new covenant. So, for instance, thou shalt not commit adultery means you've got to be married to all the women that you are living with as a wife. David is not an adulterer when he you know, takes Abigail as another wife. He's an adulterer when he gets involved with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. That's when he commits adultery. But it, 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 in, in the teaching of Jesus, it becomes clear that, that, that this state of affairs existed in that period of time after the fall until Jesus comes again, or until Jesus came, because of the hardness of men's hearts. And they were allowed for a time to, to do this, and, and they do it. Now, it's not, a, it's not a happy situation, you know that. These, these relationships are often not very happy at all. I mean, the children of Israel are the result of four different, Jacob and four different women. I mean, what a, what a band. But, the, but this, is, this is it. This is, this is humanity, isn't it? And, and it's God sort of putting a leash on it to some degree. But when we come into the new covenant, and we come to Jesus, and we come to, to his work on the cross, which is able to really cleanse and purify people, and to the new covenant blessing of the Spirit, Jesus says, when he's asked questions about divorce and so forth, he quotes Genesis 2.24, and he says, in the beginning it wasn't so. And what's implied there is it's not going to be so in the future because I have come to make it possible for the uh, purpose of God expressed in creation to at least begin to be lived out in real and meaningful ways here and now. And that's why when you get to Ephesians 5, you have, well, marriage. You know, wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love your wives, which is... You know, you're talking about mutual submission. There, there is that there. I'm not afraid to say that at all. Because, I mean, if you understand what it means to love your wife as Christ loved the church, you know, what did he do? He died for that church. He submitted unto death. But, but all of that is, 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 uh, is, is seen in one sense, but it's, it, it's the, the, the husband and wife are supposed to, the Christian husband and wife are supposed to function that way because there's something bigger going on. Marriage picks up and is ultimately fulfilled in the relationship between Christ and his people. There's a wedding supper of the Lamb that will be enjoyed one day. And, uh, and as Christians, we move in that direction. And so our relationships are to reflect the purity that exists between Christ and 
his bride, and so forth. But you see, this is my point. Jesus is the yes and amen of God, which is to say, he doesn't just uh, confirm for us the authority of the Old Testament and the truthfulness of the Old Testament. He doesn't just substantiate the New Testament because of the apostles and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But I guess what I wanted to leave you with is this. Jesus is the key to the whole thing. He's the yes and amen of God. He, he unlocks it all. And, and this doesn't just refer to authority, but this is now we're, we're doing what we're not going to do this weekend as talk about interpretation. But this is the key to interpretation. It's Jesus. So we ask ourselves when we get into all these dilemmas, well, how do we, how do we filter this through Jesus? Anyway, I've got to stop. So Jesus and the Bible, the Old Testament, well, that's, you know, that's easy. He just, at all the things I've given you, he just confirms it over and over and over again. New Testament, called to the apostles, gifted those apostles with the Spirit to authoritatively expound and preach and proclaim him. And Paul sums it all up by saying, all the promises of God, whatever they are, they're yes, they're amen in Jesus. So be it. That's what amen means. So be it. They're yes and so be it in Jesus. And so if we're Christians, we follow Jesus not only in the sense that we trust in him for the forgiveness of our sins, but we follow his example when it comes to reading and interpreting the scriptures. And what we need today is more Christian interpretation of the whole Bible. Let me uh, close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we've had uh, this morning to highlights just a fraction, really, of the evidence that's there in the scriptures about this subject. Help us never to be embarrassed by your word. And if we ever find ourselves in a position where we're tempted to, to doubt, may our minds return to this. What did Jesus think? What did Jesus believe? What did he teach? What did he say about the scriptures? And as we ponder the overwhelming evidence, may you confirm in our hearts by the ministry of the same Spirit the fact that we can trust in everything that you have said. That yes, heaven and earth will pass away. But your word, as it is found in ultimately in Jesus, and interpreted and understood in Jesus, will never pass away. Thank you. We pray these things in his mighty name. Amen.